folks, welcome to Everyday Empowerment Institute podcast. This is going to be a fantastic one with James Sutherland. He's the founding director of Office Solutions IT, but he's so much more than that. And we want to talk about everyday empowerment, conscious everyday empowerment. And really, James is a living embodiment of that. So, James, welcome to this podcast. Thanks very much for having me, Mike. Mike, you're looking good. People say we're almost brothers. You know, there's something, there's something about both of us. I, you know, I don't, I don't know, why, I don't know what, why people would say that. Do you think? Can't see it myself. Right, Mike. Mike's two good-looking, bald, intelligent people. Yeah, Nivea. The Nivea is helping me a lot. I think just keeping me that that bit of young. I think it's something to do with our vitality as well. Wow, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, that's the principle we talk about. You don't manage people you manage energy. And of course, you don't manage yourself, you manage your own energy and what energy you bring to the room. And I've got to say, from the very first time I met you, there's an energy you bring to the room. Now, we'll talk about this as we as we go on, because I'm sure at some level, it's you. And at some level, with all the development work you've done working on yourself, it's it's not, not a fluke that you bring that energy to the room. But James, Tell us firstly a bit about the James Sutherland story. Where has James Sutherland come from and how has he got to where he is today? How long have you got, Lee? Well, you can do a five-minute version. You've got, you got Let's can do, do a two-hour version. Sure. Um, okay, well, I'll start a snapshot. So James Sutherland raised in Melbourne. I'm one of four boys. Yeah. Um, my father was a doctor. My grandfather was a doctor. My mother was a nurse. My grandmother was a concert pianist, and all those have all those uh, pieces in my puzzle have contributed to who I am and who I seek restoration with, even to this day. Um, six years public primary school, which again uh, has contributed to my broader perspective of the world. Seven years in a private. Uh, school, secondary school in Melbourne. Um, where to? I went to Swinburne University and uh, studied a Bachelor of Arts, uh, three years of psychology, and lo and behold, three years of media studies. Um, I stumbled across the university radio station. And it turns out I've always had an inkling for music. And so, yeah, ended up enjoying three years at the uni and the radio station, but it had an impact on my studies as well. Uh, finished Swinburne and then uh, traveled to Europe and ended up working in England and in Greece as a 21 year old. Uh, loved that freedom. Um, again, just opening my eyes. I uh, was lucky enough to travel to give or take 20 or 30 different countries. Um, and our friends in Scandinavia, um, a little side story there, digging holes and um, building buildings in Greece. Uh, on a lunch break, went to a cafe. They had a piano. Well, I've always tinkled a little bit on the piano. So I went and had a tinkle. And um, the cafe owner came up and gave me 800 drachmas, which was like a week's worth of work. That was a <laughs> lot of wheelbarrows wow. full of rubbish. Yeah. And I said, what's that for? He said, just keep playing. Yeah. International guests are coming into the cafe. And I'm like, no problem. He said, can you come back tomorrow? I said, you betcha. So I had a month or two of doing that. And then a uh, funny thing is it would work. I went back to the UK and a mate said, listen, I'm managing a pub. And um, the owners heard that you play the piano. He'd love you to be our pianist. I said, great. Only problem is you haven't got a piano. Hmm. He said, that's all right, go with him and buy one. So I went and bought a piano with this guy and ended up living on the top story of a pub. It was called the Black Lion in uh, Kings Road uh, in Chelsea. And he, yeah, lots of fun, but who would have thought? Wow. Um, my mother loved it because her mother had played piano for a, a living. And there I was as a grandson of um, a person. Yeah. That, that I would have thought, and what about you've got the medical background in the family? The family goes, why didn't you want to be a doctor? John. Well, you know, it's interesting. At the age of 15, 16, they sent me off to the psychiatrists and got me checked. Yeah, I can do that. And it's funny because you're right, four boys. Why wouldn't we do medicine? Um, and you're right, you have generations of caring. Um, but the catch is growing up as the son of, 
we never saw the bloke. Right. We knew he loved what he did. Hmm. Uh, he's a gynecologist obstetrician, actually one of uh, Melbourne's um, top gynies and ops. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, one of his clients was a girl called Delvine Delaney. Oh, yes. I got bonus points at the school when <laughs> Dad's seeing Delvine. Oh, that's, I can tell you, Delvine Delaney was the girlfriend of the great Shane Stedman, who was a great surfboard maker in Sydney. He first met Delvine when she was about 17 or 18 on the Gold Coast, and they were a couple for quite a while. So yeah. that's another connection with Delvine Delaney. She's an absolute darling, eh? Oh, she was a lovely, lovely person. That's mm -hmm. right. In fact, I think she still is alive today, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, she Byron Bay. I think she's in Byron Bay. Yeah, that's right. Married Strop. Yes, and he or died. Yeah. yeah, John yeah. Cornell. Yes. Um, so anyway, that, that was me uh, mucking around in, and having a bit, bit of fun as a 21-year-old. Um, got the call from home saying, hey, there's an opportunity. Do you want to apply? And I did, and I won a scholarship to the Australian Film Radio and Television School. Wow. And... Um, from there, I uh, worked in regional New South Wales and regional Victoria. I uh, did four or five years in that industry and really enjoyed it. But I was frustrated with the management. It's quite interesting. As a young, uh, talented person, it seemed that I, I was more of a threat uh, to the managers and that wasn't serving me. So the nice part is I'd lent into my formal education before, so I went back to uni. And at the time, 1988, 1989, um, IT was not a common thing. You know, in fact, wow. the guys at the high school that I was at, the computer guys were real geeks. They, they were the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs. They were the uncool guys. Um, but I've always um, liked the abstract. I, I work on that line. One of the things from the psychological report is I'm in the top 1% for abstract thinking. So I was, that was, you know, doing IT. And there was a spin on it. There's a, a lady called Kate Behan who'd written a book called Business IT. Mm -hmm. And I liked that because I've always been comfortable with money. And I liked the fact that IT was this ever dynamic changing landscape. So put me into that. It was 100 hours a week and I loved it and reveled in it. Uh, and no sooner out of that, then stepped into a role, would you believe, more in sales and in management. And within five years of finishing that degree, I'd started Office Solutions IT. And um, I also started an MBA. And well, that's a snapshot. That's five minutes of change. So Beautiful. formal education and, and Office Solutions IT, as you talked about earlier, is what I do as a craft today. It's 27 years old. Um, and I'm a small piece in a large puzzle. There's 117 of us, lucky to have 20 shareholders now. And we are in two states, or we're in two countries in two states. And um, our future's bright. Mate, it's beautiful. So if I say the word to you, empowerment, what does the word empowerment mean to you? Well, I immediately think of me being with another human being and how we can help one another. So if they've got tasks that they can delegate to me, how can I be a bigger me and vice versa? How can I help them to be empowered? Uh, and together, what can we create? That's what immediately comes to mind around empowerment. And I look, that's across a whole wide, I wouldn't just focus it on business. I'd be saying mm. that as, as the human, as the human condition. So yeah. I'd be thinking about, you know, my brothers, um, who I don't tend to think of as business, but they're family to me. And that's a real, a really high priority for me. How could, how can a brother empower me? How can I be empowering my brothers? How can our family in empower uh, the circles that we oscillate in and who we interact with and inter intersect with. And certainly with 117 people on the team at Office Solutions IT, at some level, you're going, how do we go about empowering the people at Office Solutions IT? Now, as you know, at one of our lifter meetings recently, we had it in your boardroom at Office Solutions IT, and then you took people around the place and you blew their minds with all of the little things, and they're not 1%, there's a whole range of things you do there to empower and have a culture of empowerment. Do you want to just share some of the things that you think um, uh, that you've done either consciously or that have evolved at Office Solutions IT in terms of empowerment, bringing out the best in the people, bringing out the best in the business, and even every day 
There's little rituals you've got going on there on an almost a daily basis. So share some of the ones that come to mind for you. I know you're drinking out of a coffee cup there. Even the coffee cups are part of your empowerment process. So sh let's share some of those stories you've got going there. Director 25, tell us about that cup. Well, that's a good good point. So what we would say is um, in terms of empowerment, I'll often try and put structures around concepts. So when I think of empowerment, I think of my core values, our company's core values, and often they should overlap. Uh, our core five values are fun. We're not having fun, get off the bus. Uh, honest, and that's self-honest, as much as it can be brutal being honest. If I have to tell people what their IT actually looks like and is, so they can be tough conversations. Uh, care is a key factor, and we touched on that in the medical thing. As I said, my father was a gynecologist. I grew up at the age of 12, I'm answering the, the phone with a broken voice saying, hello, this is James. And I've got a woman on the end of the phone screaming, saying, my waters have broken, doctor. What do I do now? Mm -hmm. And I would be saying to her, take a deep breath. Let's put the coffee on, put the kettle on. Um, hang on two seconds. Dad, I've got another one of your screaming friends. Can you take <laughs> over here? So from a young age, I was very cool in a crisis, but ultimately caring. Yes. Uh, the last two are smart, not as in smart ass, but smart as in using our intuition and our cerebral. So providing solutions, not just a solution, providing a budget solution, providing an abundant solution. Uh, and then lastly, which points to the little trophy that I'm holding here, uh, growth is a core value. And what we mean by growth is self-growth, uh, team growth, community growth, and how, mm. how we can be walking and talking um, those values. And, and we hire around those values and we promote around those values. And something like this cup, we have a team lunch every month. And this is an example, it's flagging, this is my 25th year, a 25th year. In fact, I've got another one, which has now got 27 on it. But in fact, what happens? So in your very first, a week of being at Ops Solutions IT or the first month, you'll get a cup which will have your role, your name. In fact, it's actually as you arrive, you've got the cup on your table as well as a welcome. As a welcome gift. As a welcome and behind you is congratulations. We're thrilled to have you on board. Wow. You'll have a, a desktop, a laptop as such with screens and, and you will have a little cup which has got one on it, which is saying you've already been with us one day, one week, one month, one mm. year to come. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this is typically a projection. And what happens is the very first one you get is quite a simple cup. But this is like we've got a lot of gamers. And it's like along the way, you, you accumulate skills and talents and gold. And so at yeah, 25 years, my, my little emblem looks pretty sh bright and shiny. Well, and talking of growth, you've got the wall of fame or the wall of growth. You've got all those certificates in the foyer. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, there was an opportunity again. We, we, Throw, we have what's called a CI uh, email, which is continuous improvement. I think you talk about Kaizan. Yeah. And um, one of our team members happened to be sitting in reception saying, we've got this spherical or half sphere wall, which is hard to pin things on. They say, it's just blank. It's a bit of a waste. Why wouldn't we, if we've got uh, potential new clients, uh, potential new employees, and even existing clients, if they're sitting waiting for to pick up a laptop or for a consulting, why not have them get a deeper understanding of us? And so you're right, we have the title is growth and across probably a five by four meter um, stretch of canvas, wherever you do uh, accumulate things on your journey with OSIT, we put it up there. So we've got people who have won community awards. We've definitely got certifications. So one of the directors recently got his MBA from Curtin. Of course, that went up on the wall. I was lucky enough to win a, um, a community award um, in leadership from Youth Focus. So that's up on the wall. Lots and lots of Microsoft type certifications. And um, yeah, it's a simple thing, but as you say, straight away, it provokes. Someone who walks in our foyer is transported to a place that they hadn't been before. And it does get them asking about themselves. What am I doing in my workplace? Yeah. Why don't I celebrate? And it's not just an individual, it's our collective learning. Yep, yep. And again, you've talked about values so often. Well, A, you have companies that have no values. Uh, if they've got them, they're just on the wall, but not living 
mm. no news. So mm. your your lovely wife, Kath Sutherland, that's her whole area or well, part of her area is that the, 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 the collection and the, the articulation of values. Yeah. So tell us a bit about that process of formulating those values, but also how you go about bringing them alive on with a daily, weekly, monthly basis so that they're living, breathing values. Well, thank you for that opportunity because Kat Sutherland is uh, a strategist and um, yeah, she's changed my life immeasurably. In fact, in a minute, we're 40 years together. Oh, I congratulations, to... mate. That's thank fantastic. You. Thank you. And I, how lucky was I to bump into her looking across a classroom mm. uh, at the Australian Film, Radio and Television School oh. all those years ago. And um, yeah, let's just say, so even then, she worked as a, a writer. I was more an on-air jock and a journo. Um, but her, she worked as a copywriter, so writing ads in radio stations. And even at the end of her, I think she ended up doing maybe nine or 10 years in the industry, she actually wrote a manual on um, the poor copywriter and the, the sad briefs that you get from your sales team. So yeah. even there, it was an example of how she is a big picture thinker. And if she was going to leave the industry, the one thing she could do is impart, hey, these are the tips and tricks that helped me along the way you know, bring accountability to your sales team. Also, when you're in production doing ads, stick to your knitting. If you know you've got 30 seconds, keep it to just 60 words, all that sort of thing. Anyway, that's a side table conversation. So Kath, yes, if you get the opportunity, it's called Creating Brand Energy. Um, it's available on Amazon. You can buy it or contact Kath on her website. Um, and she is very clever in, in, as you say, breaking a business down into five core areas. And one of the key ones in there is, she talks about uh, the vision is your spark of your business. So that's, you know, say for instance, with Office Solutions IT, I was sitting at a kitchen table thinking I'm frustrated in management. I think I can do a better job myself than what's happening. And that was sort of, that was the spark of, I believe I could care for my customers better than I'm having to with the constraints that I've got in this larger company, a global company that I work for. So that was the spark. And then it's things like Kath talks about um, your values are the fuel and also how we operate um, that spark. So back to our five values and, and how we got to that. Well, the nice part is Kath makes it a whole lot of fun. She creates a, a party. She literally says, welcome to my party. And, and it's a participative thing. If you've got a team of 10 she invites all 10 and, and don't underestimate the values of maybe the, the lowest wage person. I remember one of the clients she worked with um, was a store person who sat in this collection as they went around the room. And the ideas that came from him blew the owner away and, mm. and to this day helped change uh, their business uh, for the better. But anyway, so um, she creates a fun space. It's certainly a space uh, in that of empowerment and any idea is a good idea. Everything's up on a wall. Uh, she's got structures around it where she'll be hospitable from the moment you arrive, asking you what is uh, a drink that you might have. And it wouldn't matter if it's a mocktail or if you're very specific and need a 2004 Verve Clico uh, Prim Cru. Um, but then after a dozen different questions, she will distill out of all those observations and how we work together uh, where there's common ground. And so there's out of it, it's almost like distilling, you know, bringing that concentration of ideas into five or six um, concepts that resonate amongst the group. So that's a little snapshot. Of, it's probably a bit brutal, Kath, or a bit sad the way that I've cut that to pieces. But in an essence, it's leaning on um, the group. And in our case, we had uh, something like, We've done it a number of times because we revisited it. But um, uh, 2014, there would have been approximately 30 employees, 20, probably let's say 20 employees. And those who sat around the table over three or four different sessions was probably 10 to 15. Uh, and then once it is done, then you map it out to them and they all participate in that. Um, and you sit with it. And then, as you say, then how do we activate those values? So the first, you know, one of the core things that we identified where it was very, very important was we're hiring a person. And if it all goes well, this person's with us for three, four, five years. 
uh, minimum. We'd like to think that. And in our industry, it, two and a half years is a long time because the average age is probably close to 25, 28. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, well, we're hiring them on their skills and we've got tests on that. But actually, the attitude and how they fit with us is so much more important. So, yeah, pretty quickly, we had a dozen questions around, you know, and we would actually start with them saying, you know, just to make them comfortable, they would come to the interview and we would get them for the first minute or two to talk about their CV so that we get rid of some nerves. But then we would say, we want you to come with us on a journey um, and we're going to investigate spaces that you probably haven't explored before. But please know that it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully you'll walk away, whether you get the job or not, thinking differently about yourself. So for instance, we'd start it in that softer space. Of, so we'd say one of our core values is fun. So a key question might be, if you had a superpower, what would that superpower be? And they're looking at us going, mm -hmm. I'm here to be a, an IT engineer. I don't, I don't think I, and we're going to just bear with us. There's, there's a mad science behind this. And, you know, if they said, well, I've always loved Spider-Man. Well, what is it about Spider-Man? Well, he can jump from tall build, you know, and there's a bit of science and psychology behind it. And then we'd be asking, okay, when was the last time you went to a fancy dress party? What did you wear? And then in a minute, guess what? They're taking off their armor and you're mm. starting to see their shine. Yes, yeah, they really are. Yeah. So that's the nice, easy part. And then you would progress through. So around honest, well, you're getting a little bit more challenging and honest. And we would ask, where have you been had to have honest conversations with yourself? And then we take them through those others. So care, care is a big one for us, you know, and it'll often be the line of, um, so a workmate has got something happening personally and you cover for them, but how long do you let that go on? After a week, they're still not coming to work and you're after two weeks. So you're trying to see how comfortable are they at setting boundaries mm -hmm. around caring for themselves mm -hmm. as much as mm -hmm. caring for others and, and so forth, all the way through to smart. And in a question around growth, would you believe, is things like, can you remember the first money that you earned and what you spent it on? And I remember Igor saying, yeah, like he, uh, he had a gig down at the local service station. He was all of about, I don't know, 15 or something. He might've been stacking uh, soft drinks. And he said, no, I, I didn't tell my parents, but I saved up 800 bucks and I got a pair of skates, roller skates. Wow. And like 800 bucks when he's 15. And so again, what you're seeing there is an industriousness, uh, something that he was rewarding himself. He obviously was quite talented. Mm. Um, and even to this day, I don't think he's told his parents. Wow, 800 buckets. Uh, that would have been an expensive pair of skates. He, must have got, he had, a, he had, a, had a good eye for taste at that point as well. He wasn't going, wasn't going for the budget skates. That's fantastic. So that, thank you. So then a, a couple of other realist, or real examples. So there's the interview, which is really important. And again, that's us back in 2014. And if you look at uh, Tony Say's book uh, called, uh, Tony Say was behind the IT company called Zappos. And I mm -hmm. think it's um, something like the pursuit of happiness. Uh, anyway, um, he in that book, he refers to interviewing around values. And we were like, ah, it right. wasn't just our idea. No. I remember sharing that with a client at a Christmas party. She's going, I've never heard of it before. She said, well, yeah. it's a shame, isn't it? How did we yeah. end up in that place? But yeah, so there's the interview and where we... Um, play or activate our values. On a day-to-day, -day, uh, our teams have KPIs and are measured and will report on. And in any given quarter, I need to report back to my uh, manager uh, areas where I've demonstrated care or growth or honest. So again, we're keeping that alive. And even as we said, those monthly lunches where there's a collection of give or take 60 or 70 of us upstairs having lunch together once a month, they say a, a family that eats together, stays together. And we've found yes. great value in that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, something as simple as every month, there are new cups being passed to new team members. Someone's come up with an anniversary. Someone's changed team. So you'll go from, um, the dark is for the dark side sales. We're a tech company. Anyway, I don't see it that way, but uh, there's we have 13 different colored teams. Um, so there's that sort of thing happening. And, and in that uh, gathering or get together, 
we have two awards that are given out. One is the growth award, and we typically acknowledge people who have um, achieved something. And the other is the team award, and that's voted by the collective. And it can be for a variety of different um, sort of team oriented um, inspiration. That's, that's fantastic. So there's always the growth award. It's not like you rotate value by value month by month the growth award is the yeah it's a good question I'll, I'll throw it again i could throw that on our ci we do over four, the last uh year we did over 1400 ci continuous improvements on the company we have a separate oh. team the service delivery team work on that wow and, you, and the good thing is you're measuring it so you know the number yes. what are we doing systematically as you say kaizen continuous and never-ending improvement Brilliant. Uh, what I do want to do also, James, is talk about you in terms of your own personal development, the journey you've been on, because I, I saw at your place, uh, I mean, and when you and I first had a coffee months ago, we talked about different workshops and programs that you'd, you'd done in terms of, so A, your attitude to personal development and personal empowerment, and two, just some of the programs you've done, because as I, I saw that photo at your house, were you and Kath are in Tibet or Nepal yeah. or somewhere? So, can because this, what I really want to get to is the inner world development. We're talking about energy. So, give, give us a bit of insight into that inner world the development, the personal development work you've done over the years. Okay. So, let's open the bonnet on James Sutherland. Let's, let's have a look inside. Um, I'm a person who uh, really likes to have a balance between uh, mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and I work on those three areas, and I have worked on them ever since I can remember. And I, I talked about my mother was a nurse. That's just the tip of the iceberg. To give you an example, my mother, uh, as a, would she have been, give or take 26, 28 year old with a baby, she picked up the first edition of Autobiography of a Yogi. Yeah. We're talking 1960, 1961. And that was the introduction of yoga to modern Western civilization. It's a massive, but that, uh, that, that one book's had such a profound impact uh, as you right across Western, Western I society. I don't know, side story, though, I don't know if you knew, but um, for Steve Jobs' uh, funeral, for his intimate, he had a couple of funerals, but for his intimate or his inner circle, there were 30, 35 people. And his wish was that each person at that funeral got that book. Amazing. Of a yogi. Amazing. So if you haven't read it, I'd encourage you. Hmm. So again, what's that about? That's that spiritual. That's feeding the spiritual, no matter what spiritual looks like. For some, it is religion, and I'm okay with that. Again, there was my had a very strong mother, uh, had a strong grandmother, strong mother, so matriarchs. Of, uh, and I've married a strong woman and my three brothers have married strong women. And I think that in itself has really helped define James. Mm -hmm. So James is very comfortable with his feminine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a male, but with a strong feminine. Mm -hmm. um, I celebrate conversation. I celebrate um, higher learnings. So yeah, touching on... There we are. There was a photo of us. And you're right, in Tibet, have you ever met someone with six fingers and six toes? Because uh, no. that photo is actually a photo of a yogi with six fingers and six toes. And he's actually playing a femur. Whoa. So we're at 4,000 metres. And how did we get there? So that's a close friend of ours. She was turning 50 and she said to uh, her collective of friends, if you're up for it, I'm off to India for a month and there's going to be two weeks with a guy called Andrew Harvey. And he's an ex-professor at Oxford. He's the youngest. I think yeah, no one has achieved the results that he did uh, as an 18, 19 year old. And he was a professor at 2026. 20, uh, and funnily enough, was exposed to the, uh, to the Bill Gates and very quickly those sorts of inspirational people uh, travel in, in um, and high circles. The catch is that journey was a, a was a trip for Andrew, to be honest, because he was going back to meet some friends who had died. Hmm. So how does that work? So he co-wrote the autobiography. Uh, the um, is it the Tibetan Book of Death and Dying? 
Wow. You know I've heard of that book. It's, it's actually quite a story. famous book. I, I don't know if it's the Tibet, but it's definitely a book of death and dying. And he co-wrote that uh, with a, um, a guru who has passed. So we were going back to meet him. Gee. And that guy is 21 now. So can you imagine? They, like reincarnation is no different to the way you and I talk about Fords and Holdens and Toyotas. It's in that world. Their dialogue, their perception yep. of the world. Yep. So that was an incredible opportunity. And again, we spent a couple of weeks that when you're at high altitude, there's a lot of subliminal stuff happening. So what a great opportunity. And I I thank Karen Marsh for um, inviting us. And and we're actually um, yeah, we we went to a cave where Buddha and Jesus had met. So Whoa. it was highly spiritual. Uh, on my body side, I actually was able to grab a few friends. We drove a bus to the, well, we didn't drive it. We had a driver take us to the high or second highest motorable road in the world. Goodness. And that's the border of uh, Ladakh, India and Pakistan. We're at um, 5,100 meters, just under 18,000 feet. Uh, and man, that was a trip in itself. And we jumped on our bikes and we came down 40 kilometers and we went from snow and wind to rain and sunshine. <laughs> but there was a, so why I'm going with all those conversations is I really enjoy going to the edge, my edge, yes. being uncomfortable and exploring. And, and we did spend being with an Andrew Harvey, we would we started off like going to the gym. We would do a half hour meditation. And by the end of it, we're doing three and four hour meditations. Wow. And it wasn't for everybody. I remember one of the guys is he's uh, his spirit is mother earth. And I remember at the last session, Andrew sort of got quite motivated. And, and one of the guys in the room said, Andrew, 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 do you expect us to drink, drink this lime green cordial that you're feeding us? Mm -hmm. He really questioned it. And, and I love that dialogue. And that's where, again, in anything that I put forth today, please question it. I welcome it. It's my naive and limited view of the world. I'm a white Anglo-Saxon. You know, I've been very comfortable in my, my growth and development. And I'm very, very aware of my biases. But that was a lovely dialogue uh, that was taking place after such a development. Um, so you, body -wise, of course, you, body-wise, you're, you're a, a cyclist. Yes. So so the sport, the in terms of that, and you've done a, a pile of bike riding. And so just on a daily basis, let's yeah. go through mind, body, spirit. What is your daily and weekly routine in regard to mind, body, and spirit? So I'll start my day with a meditation, uh, tentatively 15 to 20 minutes of connecting. What time of day is that? Well, in the season, it can be 4, 4 a.m. before I'm out at 4.30. Um, and typically uh, when we jump on the bike and have our sessions, uh, yeah, you're happy to do 50 or 60 Ks before a coffee shop at 7.30. Uh, and, and a lot of that's mad science in the sense that there's less cars on the road. Uh, yeah. I'm with other like-minded. So very early on, uh, Lee, when they first introduced me to this sport 20, 23 years ago or whatever, I just I remember coming back from it going, these are my people. They're up at Sparrow Fart. They've done preparation to be there. Like you don't just rock up. You have to, first of all, you're going to pull on this weird outfit with a, you know, a nappy in your bum and you've got to have gloves and you know, your torch and your lights have got to be recharged. So I was just thinking, these are organized, thoughtful people and they're, they're motivated people. I was sitting having, again, in the coffee shop, I'm talking to a variety of different people. Wouldn't matter if they're artists or um, medicos or... Uh, tradies that were people wanting to better themselves and i just thought this works for me so anyway that's um i get started uh, with the, that routine um we're talking about the body what's really important for me is my nutrition and diet so um i'm always as i've got older i've got all this uh, the supplements and things that again there's probably a lot of placebo but yeah having done bike riding for 20 plus years i have glucosamine i stumbled on that years ago that's a bit like superannuation um, and I've got things like that. So flaxseed oil helps with me for my cholesterol and everyone's got their own little stuff. Um, I have been uh, very lucky with my, and I, and I say luck, um, but I've been very lucky with my health. Uh, I contribute where I can. 
but I know that uh, you've been blessed in many, many ways. Um, so yeah, the bike ride, out I go, done my um, coffee shop. And, and the social is a really important part of that. Yeah. I can't emphasize that enough. I, even if I'm sitting, not saying anything, and I do, it's hard to believe. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I love the connection um, and that's crucial to me. Uh, and then the bigger stuff, I'm a small piece in a big puzzle. Uh, I often will uh, combine and that's where you'll see I'm a bit of an opportunist. That's definitely an underlying theme for me. Yes, I manage my energy and I feed it. And I, I honestly, if I showed you my team, my, um, what do they say? My, um, uh, it'd be like, I don't know, um, like a rock band has their, their groupies or their um, roadies. I've got, um, yeah, my peeps. So I do, I, I was this morning after a bike ride, I was at a Cairo. And Paul looks after me. He keeps me aligned. And, and that's more than just my spine. It's a, so is that a weekly thing, a monthly thing? Or how often do you go? Again, to it'll reflect my schedule if I'm interstate. But typically in any given month, if I could, I'd go every week. Um, again, just maintenance. And, and in parallel with Paul, I have an acupuncturist. And again, that's trying to manage my energy. Uh, when, he, when I specifically went to him for, a, I was having trouble with the top of my feet. And he said, this is a reflection. I see people in here who are ballroom dancers, James. And I said, well, that's interesting. If I look at my foot and the way it's angled when I'm pedaling, and remember I'm at it for 20 years now, mm -hmm. I'm actually a ballroom dancer. So, mm -hmm. and he said, and we can work on that. And he has, and that's, I've had wonderful success, but he also took my pulse and he said, wow, you have a strong pulse, James. He said, do you stress? I said, well, I, yes, I definitely have stress. I like mm -hmm. to look, I look for healthy stress, mm -hmm. but for me, it's like, I'm sitting on this bowser of energy and I've got to manage it. When I, when I let it rise too much, I can actually be dangerous to James and I can be hazardous to the people around me, which that's not good. And, and you say that's what, anger energy or anxiety energy or what? what or, all, or just, all of that. I can yeah. so easily sand. I can lose my fuse, you know. Uh, and as a male, yeah, that's the beauty of testosterone. But when we're in the dark, anger is the worst insult. Mm. It is a, it's insanity. Mm. Yeah, in fact, if I was cheating on my wife or I was angry, they'd go, we're okay with your wife thing, but what's this anger? Yeah. What, what's that about? Yeah. Yeah. Well, was the Buddhists, they say anger is like hanging onto a hot rock. Yeah. Burns you, burns you, but doesn't it do anything does. to the other person. Uh, so again, on the routine, uh, my working life doesn't feel like work. Lee, it's interesting. You could, I would literally pay to come and be around these peeps. Nice. I'm, I'm around so many inspiring peoples. And, and like you talked about me, uh, us meeting and colliding, um, I'm very good at finding, and, and it's taken me a while to get there. If I had my time over as a teenager and even in my 20s, I was wanting to please and be cool. I wished I'd spent more time with the uncool because that would have helped me a bit better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ironically, I married an uncool who is uncool, uncool now. Yeah, well, yeah. Since she didn't get vaxxed and I did the right thing and got a couple of shots and it didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I got really sick, but I, I, you know, I sit back and go, I really admire you. So she's a, you'd say she's a non-conformist in that regard. Well, yes, uh, but it's also having faith in her. She has looked after her health for forever. She's had yellow fever vaccines. She's done vaccines. She was just questioning what was going on. Mm -hmm. And again, critical thinking. Where yeah. is our critical thinking? So yeah. I got lucky intersecting mm -hmm. with that person 40 years ago. And man, mm -hmm. I'm a much better version for it. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I don't know how I got so there. We're going back to the, your daily empowerment yeah. mind, body spirit routine. that's right so yeah so office solutions it was something that I dream, we dreamed up kath was across the table i roped a brother in and we, we worked together for eight years and then he moved back to the east um so yeah again um something like office solutions it is a place where uh, i my soul is fed my so i often talk about the b model think of the letter b and if that's a representation of our mind and our body, how much of a distortion is the upper B for your mind versus your body? 
And I'm constantly trying to make sure I am allowing that lower part of the B letter. And, and that's what I find with the team that I've got around me. They, they know that I'm creative. They know that I'm a little bit weird. And I guess I've ended up working around a whole lot of special needs people. Well, you've we got, get you've, it, we get you've it. consciously shaped that ecosystem, not the least of which the values, and then using it uh, the, the the values as a recruiting tool and then you keep the values alive so you know we talk about conscious everyday empowerment versus unconscious everyday disempowerment you know mm -hmm. people not even aware of the things they do and say and if you talk about mind body and spirit what they think what they eat uh, mm -hmm. who they surround themselves with uh, that they're actually disempowering themselves mm -hmm. through their own mind body and spirit activity so you it sounds like you're a reader what is what what is but well, you talk about uh, you know autobiography of a yogi what what are some of the one key books that you would say have shaped you and what are you reading at the moment ah, thank you yes my discipline is a book a week and oh, um that's interesting a yeah, book a week like 50 a book books a, a year at least and then if i think of you know my next I'm hoping I've got another 4,000 weeks on the planet. I see myself as 104. Wow. Um, so you're reading them or listening to them or both? Both, whatever works. I, to be honest, I this little guy is, yes. uh, I've got an addictive personality. Do you notice that, Lee? 12, 12. Uh, I like, that's called synchronicity. I love that sort of 12, 12 means that we're- Only a Virgo would have seen that. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, a book a week, and again, it's uh, to expand me, to grow me, to improve my vocabulary, to improve my perspective. Um, yeah, look, a couple of books jump out at me. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, and yep. why a, a simple takeout, and it, it's in that space of scarcity versus abundance. I'm glad you that's brought that up. Really yep. big piece. Um, so Robert Kiyosaki, when I read it, it's a great story. Uh, if you haven't had the chance, in a nutshell, Robert's dad. Uh, was at university and was very conservative. Robert's best mate's dad was an entrepreneur and they were chalk and cheese as far as um, thinking about the concept of how money does have a compound interest and utilise it, you know, leverage, leverage, leverage. Um, that's it in a nutshell. So one of the key takeouts for me, I remember we were looking for a house to buy. I was all of 27, something like that, early 90s. And... Um, he says, don't ask or don't say, I can't afford mm. this house. He mm. would say, how can mm. I? How can I afford it? How yeah. can I? Mm. And I walk with that to this day, 20 plus years, 30 plus years later. I asked that about our business. You know, when we hit a roadblock, it's not can't, it's how. How can we? And often I don't have the answer. I've got to sleep on it. I've got to you know, bounce it off a dozen other people. That's why I gravitate to smart people like you, Lee. Um, yeah, so uh, Bob Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Then again, on the, I like to think whole brain, so left, right side. Um, I wear my watch. Here's a little Virgo thing for you. I wear my watch on my right hand. And but that... Right hand, you're right-handed. You are right-handed or you're left-handed? I'm actually, I do both. But um, I'm right, I wear it because I'm more right-brained. So I'm more creative having my watch every time I look at it triggers my left brain, which brings me back to logic. I do like numbers and al algorithm and boundaries and structure, but isn't that interesting on a daily basis? I, I know myself, I know I can go down a rabbit hole. So something like a simple, and people say, oh, you got wow. your watch on your right, but don't you right-handed, wouldn't you look on your, that's James managing James. It's As a, a trigger. So again, in that space of left, uh, the Alchemist by a writer called Paulo Coelho. Yes, I've heard of that book. I'm not sure I've He's read it. from but, yeah. Brazil. He's written many, many books. Um, yep. He's a great author. But that's a beautiful um, myth. It's a mythology yep. about a shepherd. Um, and again, I like it because, again, it's a journey. Um, it's a young person going through many changes, but then coming back at the very end going, well, actually, uh, the diamond... We're, at, we're in the farm that I was already living on. Why did I need to travel the world when it was all in my front? Wow. Well, we often talk about that. The diamonds are actually in the backyard. People walk over them 
all the time. I mean, you know, in our lifter meetings, when we start to give ideas to people, mm -hmm. people are walking over their stories and what they do well and what they miss. So literally discovering or rediscovering the diamonds that are actually already there. So just yeah. on that, what's I'm thinking your reading routine, because we say, you know, leaders are readers and obviously mm -hmm. a critical part of self-empowerment is reading and information. Mm -hmm. So what is your re reading routine? Do you read in the morning, at night, at lunchtime, in bed? Do you have a reading chair? How do you do it? That's right. And it's uh, it's a daily thing. The best part about it, in fact, if you saw, I carry a little man bag. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that works for me. And at any given time, I've got a book. Right. So you'd be surprised. My wife's running 10 minutes late, five minutes play, right, late. I don't get stressed. I flick up and, uh, you know, there's a, why do I like Dervla? She's a local West Australian. She was 12 years a lawyer and right. then uh, found that, guess what? She can write uh, murder mystery novels. Um, but yeah, so it'd be those micro minutes. And before I go to bed, again, the danger is it's easy to pick this up and have a look. In fact, you saw me doing that last night when I emailed you with a couple of thoughts about today's conversation. Yes, 10.59 from what I recall. Yeah, not good. Not good because that's blue light and that will actually keep me awake and keep my brain ticking. Whereas yes. opening a book and I can suddenly, you know, Bob Geldof sings it in one of his songs. I can be actually in Brazil. I can be at Machu Picchu as I'm turning the pages and going to sleep. So a routine is at least... Uh, 20 pages before I fall asleep. The catch wow. is sometimes it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm going, James, go to bed. <laughs> so really that's a goal you have is 20 pages a night before you go to sleep. That's how you get through your book a week. Give or take, yeah. And it's some, I picked up I Am Pilgrim the other day. That's 900 pages. That was a busy week trying to crunch that fella. <laughs> well, that, as you say, there's, there's 120 odd pages a day to get through yeah. that. Yeah, Mate, that, see what I love about what we're doing at Everyday Empowerment is you know we we love NLP as a as one of the tools that we use to help people. We so, say you know um, modeling, use yeah. the same process and strategy as a high performer. You're going to with you're not necessarily going to you know copy Greg Norman or Michael Phelps or you know James Sutherland, but you're certainly going to rise like all ships rise on the rising tide. So these little insights, like book a week, 20, 20 pages a night, uh, all these little things that you're consciously doing on a daily basis to empower yourself. But one of the things that triggered me to say, James, let's do an interview, was we see time and time again in our lifter group and in our everyday life, yes. people's attitude to scarcity and abundance. Yes. Um, and so as you say, I can't afford it. Well, how can I afford it? What What have you learned over the years or what's some of the driving thoughts that uh, help you in and around scarcity and abundance? As there's not enough, I've got to be careful versus the cake is... What, what, what's, what's influenced you and what okay. what are some of this, the internal operating system that helps drive you around scarcity versus abundance? Okay, everyone's got stories and I'll, I'll praise you in a couple of stories. So... First of all, uh, when I came to Perth, my uh, wage was a uh, thousand bucks a week, 12 grand a year. I was a salesman. I was working for a software company. And a um, thousand bucks a week or a thousand bucks a month? Uh, sorry, a thousand bucks a month. 12 yeah. Months. Thank you. Um, I had the best fun. You know, it was ridiculous how money didn't influence the sort of your lifestyle. I can remember vividly buying a takeaway chook with half a dozen mates, sitting down at City Beach under the lights, nine o'clock on a Friday night, Might, maybe had a cheap bottle of wine, something, but laughing and living. Mm. So part of that stuck. I thought, that's interesting. I don't have to earn a million bucks a year and drive a flash car, have a big house or whatever. Mm. I don't need that. Mm. It's like, what, what floats my boat? And more often than not, it'll be, as I talked earlier, be my relationships uh, and that energy thing, the laughter, the joy. Um, yeah, people. Uh, so that's one. The second one, well, I, I definitely, you know, here I am, it's like a reformed smoker. I was a tight ass lead. Damn it. I, I'm embarrassed. And when I talk to my nieces who are now 20 and young adults are going, 
you've always been generous from James. And I'm going, ask Auntie Kat, she'll tell you. You know, we were a couple of years into our business and I was watching every penny. And I remember Kath worked for Qantas and she said, hey, we've got this opportunity. Um, it's only for the staff. We can fly over Antarctica uh, and it's only 500 bucks each. Hmm. I said, we can't afford it. We're not doing it. It's off. She comes back two weeks later. They've dropped the price. It's 250 each. I said, we're not doing it. We can't. You don't understand the pressure. Hmm. We didn't do it. And then a friend comes back from doing it. And that's the power of regret. I live that. That we, she said, the friend came back, said, we popped the champagne, we're overlooking Antarctica. And again, what a different perspective. I love those, you know, travel will bring new perspectives. And I mm. shortchanged, not just, well, I feel bad because Kath was like, we should, we could, we, and I've been the, the villain. Um, but then again, shortchanged James and the impact that James can have on people that he adores and, and lives and loves. Um, then another a third story in the mix. So I ended up at a point where I had a really bad uh, back. L3 and 4 had herniated discs. And I ended up, would you believe, uh, 26 days on my back, not working. I, just, wow. I would go to the office. I would lie on the boardroom table and make my calls. And my brother came in and said, Jim, it's not a good look. The staff aren't happy. I said, All right, okay, I'll go. <laughs> anyway. Uh, a lot of that back stuff, yes, there was the physical, but a big part was the mental. And I've got to tell you, when I owned what I was doing around the scarcity, you know, that whole thing shortchanging James, money, my relationship with money was a big thing for me. Uh, secondly, in, uh, two other things in there was the delegation thing. I needed to learn to delegate and delegate properly. Um, what was the third one? Well, let's, it was as much... Um, yeah, that was a personal one where I didn't feel supported and what a load of rubbish that was. In a minute, people are popping around trays of lasagnas. But yeah, so if you ask Kat, what was a significant change for James Sutherland's perspective after the, my, I got my back back on track and it, I didn't have an operation, I ended up working with um, some neuro networkers, blah, blah, blah. And that's where I got into the cycling and swimming. But um, she would tell you, from there on in, I said, Kath, whatever we, yep, let's go for holidays. Let's go out for a bite to eat. And guess what? Life was fine. Yeah. It was yeah. more of that Bob Kiyosaki. We could. Yeah. We could. yeah. And I can hear in your language there, shortchanging James, but not only shortchanging James, shortchanging Kath. And now I can, I can feel that as you say it, that's a key, key driver as in, your relationship with abundance and scarcity you don't want to short change yourself or short change the people that you you live with and i love that piece we talk about laughing and living what what a great what a great combo james i'm conscious of our our time mate yes is, is there anything i haven't asked you that you'd like to share in regard to uh empowerment everyday empowerment uh success or anything you'd like to share with our with our listeners or our members yeah, I would. The last sort of piece in the, the puzzle of James and, um, you know, and I've got an anniversary coming up. I'm uh, celebrating 60 decades this weekend and looking forward to you on the, seeing you on the dance floor. But yeah. um, I'm still exploring and I get the thing about ageing is it's a bit like I'm not who I was, but I'm also evaluating who that who I thought I might be that's a little bit abstract uh, but what I'm saying there is um I actually as a discipline goes Lee I I work hard to have mentors in different age groups so I was with my mentor on the weekend and he's uh, he's just turned nine and he was sharing with me that um he's really he's feeling the energy's being squeezed out of him at can, nine or 90? No, he's nine. He's nine, just, nine, nine. Okay. Extremely articulate. Okay. Um, and he talked about like, he, there's, he can, there's a time in his week and his month where he can do whatever he wants, no boundaries, and he loves it. And he wants more and more and more of that. But he's just finding his, you know, magic, his, his kid magic 
is mm. getting crushed. Mm. And he's right. Mm. And for me, I'd be asking if anyone's listening or take something out of this, it is a Rubik's Cube. If you crack that algorithm, give me a call. It's 0413-051-333. I'm, I'm working on my inner child. I'm regularly uh, diving in to that the beautiful five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old James. Um, I've been blessed in not having children, but it's a double-edged sword because there's times where you think what could have been. But the, the unusual part, and that's where I feel a little bit of a fake Lee, is I'm, you know, not parenting makes me less, less responsible or I'm irresponsible. I, the consequences of me and my bike and doing dumb things on a mountain bike not, you know, yeah, it'll impact Kath, but not a fan, you know, not children, so to speak. So that's a gift that I've got, and I appreciate that. And in fact, I'd wrap it up by saying, um, I had a nephew say to me, Uncle James, I'm really glad in a way that you don't have kids, because unlike the other adults, you don't give a fuck if you mm. fuck up. Mm. And so that's what I'd be asking of everybody, you know, when is it that you do give yourself the space to be okay with failure? Yeah, brilliant. Well, of course, that's one of the Fs we have in Lifter besides freedom. We talk about the freedom, the freedom to actually try new things and somewhere in there, the freedom to actually fail because there can be no success without failure along the way and bouncing and bouncing back. In fact, in Kiyosaki talks about there's no such thing as a mistake. There's only a learning experience. It's like the mistakes are learning experiences. You just keep bouncing back. James, this has been a fantastic time together. Thank you so much. And I look forward to us together continuing to grow our, our lifter business network, lifting local businesses uh, right around Australia. That's our plan. And your energy, that positive energy you bring, um, and that Virgo brain as well, uh, wearing the watch on the other hand. So all the things we learn about people in these interviews, fantastic, mate. So thank you so much for your time. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Same back at you. Love you. Thanks, mate. All the best. Thanks, mate. Blessings.